Hi everybody, my name is Gert van Hecke. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Development Policy and Management, IOB, at the University of Antwerp. And currently I'm doing research on topics related to environmental governance and rural development. More particularly, uh, and as I will partly show in this short lecture, I have been studying the potential and limitations of an increasingly popular instrument called Payments for Ecosystem Services, or PES. In this lecture, I will briefly describe this concept and reflect upon some of its main potentials and limitations. And I will try to explain uh, to you how this concept relates to global environmental policy instruments, such as, for example, Red Plus. Lecture basically is a critical reflection uh, on the concept of payments for ecosystem services as a new environmental and development policy tool. I will start with a very short contextualization in which I will show you how conservation policies are increasingly based on what we can call ecosystem services uh, thinking. Then I will talk about the emergence of uh, markets and payments for ecosystem services, uh, both from a theoretical and a more practical point of view. I will also discuss the main policy and academic criticisms on market-based conceptualizations of PES. And finally, I will also show you how these criticisms have led to a new way of analyzing the potential or future of PES. In order to better understand how the ecosystem services and PES concept emerged, uh, it's important to briefly take a look at the history of conservation thinking during the past uh, 40 years. With the risk of oversimplification, we can see in this table how conservation in the 1970s gained increasing attention at the political level uh, which initially resulted in the establishment of several international conventions and also in the exponential growth of protected areas or nature reserves, often called uh, fences and fines or a command and control approach. Um, this rather conservationist policy did not really take into account the needs of local people, which often uh, resulted in conflicts. The rise of social movements and the concept of sustainable development in the late 70s and 80s resulted in more, uh, let's say, participatory and, and community-based policy tools in which more attention was given to local livelihoods. At the same time, a growing awareness of a positive relation between poverty and environmental degradation also resulted in so-called integrated conservation uh, and development projects, which were based on the belief that pressure on natural resources could be reduced by offering alternative incomes that are not based on resource uh, extraction. However, um, an increasing number of researchers during the 90s questioned uh, the impacts of these projects on both conservation and development uh, results. And it is at this point that economists actively entered the conservation scene and advocated uh, that environmental degradation is mainly caused by nature's exclusion uh, from the economy. This gave rise to a new way of looking at ecosystems as fixed capital stocks that produce flows of uh, benefits or uh, ecosystem services to human societies. The concept of ecosystem services gained increasing attention and it was defined as the direct or indirect benefits that people obtain from ecosystems. These benefits or services are generally subdivided into provisioning, regulating, cultural and supporting services, as shown in the table at the left uh, and with some examples included. The concept of ecosystem services also led to a growing number of monetary valuation exercises and in a famous article 
the global value of ecosystem services was estimated at $33 billion a year. During the past 10 years, the ecosystem services concept has become extremely popular as it was seen as a, uh, a successful new way of looking at the importance of environmental conservation and as it succeeded to attract attention, uh, attention sorry, from politicians, academics and society as a whole. Today, it is without any doubt uh, the dominant paradigm for thinking and communicating on environment and development. However, we could also say that the ecosystem services metaphor started uh, developing a life of its own. While the original goal was precisely to awaken society to think about the importance of na nature conservation, um, at the same time, its underlying philosophy also paved the way to new institutional conservation mechanisms that are based on the com commodification of these uh, same ecosystem services. The creation of markets for ecosystem services should be seen in a context of general discontent with other more, let's say, traditional policy tools such as subsidies and taxes and state regulations, which are often criticized uh, to be very costly, inefficient and ineffective. At the same time, neoliberal policies during the 80s and 90s also paved the way to discourses on the role of well-defined property rights and markets as a guarantee for environmental supply. The first environmental markets uh, emerged in the United States in the mid-90s, uh, for example, through the creation of cap-and-trade markets for uh, sulfur dioxide or wetland mitigation banking. At the international level, we have seen the emergence of mechanisms such as the clean development uh, mechanism and the European Union emission trading system, for example. But one of the most recent and probably most famous examples is the so-called mechanism of paying for reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation in developing countries, also known as the RED or RED plus mechanism. There are also numerous initiatives in developing countries to establish national and local market systems for the delivery of ecosystem services, such as a national PES program in Costa Rica, but also PES projects in other countries around the world, such as South Africa, China, Mexico, and recently also Peru. This brings us to the discussion of the origin and underlying philosophy of payments for ecosystem services. The mainstream literature on key has built on some key assumptions of environmental economics. Schematically, the underlying train of thought usually goes as follows. PES starts from an explicit focus on ecosystem services, which are mostly public goods and therefore mostly externalities from the farmer's point of view. This means that they are not intentionally produced and that they do not have a market and as such no price and therefore no direct um, exchange value. As such, the land user will not be motivated to protect or improve ecosystems, which results in under provision of ecosystem services. In this sense, environmental degradation is mainly perceived as a problem of market failure or the inexistence of markets. Inspired by the so-called Coase theorem, PES advocates hold that market creation will allow private negotiation between different actors which should help produce positive externalities or, in that sense, ecosystem services at the lowest social cost. The market logic underlying the whole idea is clearly shown in Wunder's mainstream definition, which defines PES as a voluntary transaction where a well-defined ecosystem service is being bought by an ecosystem service buyer from an ecosystem service provider if and only if the ecosystem service provider secures ecosystem service provision. As such, PES 
contains the idea of encouraging private landowners to protect or restore nature on their agricultural land by offering them direct conditional economic incentives. This slide shows us the whole idea at the level of a watershed. It shows us how downstream households will pay upstream farmers for good environmental land use practices, such as the implementation of agroforestry systems or forest conservation, in order to assure the supply of good water quality and quantity uh, further down, downstream. The same basic reasoning goes for global or international PES schemes, such as the Red Plus mechanism, in which the global community pays local communities in developing countries for forest conservation and management um, in order to secure the supply of, of clean air, for example. In practice, we mainly find PES mechanisms in developing countries and um, especially in Latin America. As said before, there are examples of national PES programs, for example, in Costa Rica, uh, where the government pays certain farmers uh, for the protection of forests on their land, and also an increasing number um, of local PS programs, mainly based on the watershed model that we saw before. Most of these experimental programs are financed uh, by multilateral organizations, such as the World Bank and the Global Environment Fund, or big conservation NGOs, such as the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. The most popular ecosystem services that are currently targeted in these program, programs sorry, are carbon sequestration, hydrological services, and biodiversity protection. The huge popularity of PS can be explained by its simple idea of compensating poor farmers to protect nature on their land. As such, it promises a a win-win situation in which the, the environment will be protected and at the same time poor farmers will be lifted out of poverty through the payments they obtain. The assumption that markets are apolitical, objective and self-regulating and therefore facilitate political decision-making on difficult environmental issues also contributes to the popularity of PES. Okay, so far um, I have been describing the main underlying theory of PS, which is mainly based on market-based uh, rhetoric and which we could call the first generation PS. During the past five years, however, this market-based conceptualization of PS has received a lot of criticism from various angles. The majority of these criticisms are mainly related to the perception of PS as a neoliberal conservation instrument. We can basically distinguish, distinguish sorry, between three main criticisms. The first is that various authors completely reject PES as improper commodification processes that attempt to cash ecosystem services on newly created markets. They suspect that the whole idea of PES is not so much based on saving nature but more about finding new arenas for markets to operate in. In this sense, PES is perceived as a perverse market-based solution to environmental problems that ironically were created by markets in the first place. Furthermore, through the use of popular win-win discourses, PES advocates create the belief that the underlying ecological contradiction of capitalism can be resolved by further market creation without any need for structural changes and corresponding political actions. A second critique holds that PES and the ecosystem services concept in fact disguise the complex nature of ecosystems which contains a number of social and ecological risks. The popular discourse of ecosystems as producers of different ecosystem services creates the illusion that ecosystems are easily convertible into separate and quantifiable entities, which are the ecosystem services, 
while in fact ecosystems are very complex. This fragmented focus on certain ecosystem services has already led to the creation of certain ecosystems at the cost of other ecosystems. For example, and as shown uh, in the pictures below, uh, the conversion of biodiversity rich forests to palm oil plantations eligible for carbon credits. A third and last major critique relates to the potentially unequal social consequences of PES mechanisms. There is a broad literature on how market creation usually favors those with economic and social power and how it excludes the poor. At the local level, this can result in increased competition for control over ecosystems that produce valuable services, a process which is also called green grabbing. These worries are increasingly reflected by social and indigenous movements around the world who are worried about land grabbing dynamics provoked by international market mechanisms such as Red Plus. In terms of global justice, PS also conceals structural poverty issues as it offers a mechanism and a rationale to buy biodiversity in developing countries from the poor who sell cheap. These critiques are valuable and obviously deserve further discussion, but at the same time, it is important to realize that PS theory mostly does not correspond to PS practice. PS is often sold as an attractive market-based alternative, precisely to get access to funds from organizations such as the World Bank. In practice, however, most PS schemes are not confined to free markets, but are mostly based on government or donor-induced mechanisms in which the prices for ecosystem services are negotiated through other than market mechanisms, often resulting in symbolic uh, compensation. Therefore, it is important to go beyond the more ideological and theoretical debates and focus on a more constructive debate on the appropriateness of certain elements of PES. This more constructive debate has led to what we can call a second generation uh, PES agenda, which goes beyond the market-based philosophy and focuses on the potential of PES as part of a broader policy mix taking into account the different social, political, cultural, and economic dynamics uh, taking place on the field. This new agenda explicitly focuses on the interaction between TS mechanisms and other existing uh, local institutions, uh, such as social norms and practices, and how this interaction translates into real incentives for um, pro-environmental uh, behavior or action. It also focuses on the social consequences of a particular mix of policy instruments in terms of, for example, social equity and environmental justice. Uh, to the end of, of my presentation and to conclude, I would just like to summarize the main points that I tried to explain during the past 15 minutes. I've tried to show you how PES and ecosystem services thinking have gained a lot of attention during the last few years. At the same time, I've tried to show you the importance of critically assessing the underlying uh, philosophy uh, and the practical consequences of this policy instrument. In this sense, we saw how the mainstream of first generation PES mainly builds on a market-based philosophy and how this has been rightly criticized by what we could call uh, PES skeptics. But moving beyond the more ideological debates and focusing more on PES practice, we saw how a new research agenda should focus on the potential of this instrument as part of a broader policy mix with due attention for environmental and social outcomes. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope you enjoyed this presentation.